Hi, do you like being scared? Embrace the feeling as I take over this channel. Are you ready? My mother got married last year up in the mountains. It was a very nice wedding and my mother and her new husband had decided to rent a huge cabin up in the mountains close to the church they got married in and they had all the guests come over to celebrate that night. After a few hours of drinking, my stepsister and I, along with her boyfriend, decided to explore the woods behind the cabin. There was a steep incline behind the cabin that led into the woods, and the three of us had a hell of a time getting down it. My sister's boyfriend was the only one with a flashlight, and because we were all so drunk, we somehow didn't think it was necessary to bring more. When we reached the bottom of the incline, we began to walk forward into the trees. It was completely pitch black anywhere that the light was not shining, and being so drunk, I was having fun walking through the darkness, completely not expecting what happened next. We had split up, and I was now by myself, surrounded by darkness and trees. I stumbled in one direction, and then another, and then fell down. I sat up, alone, and then looked up into the trees. I could see the tops of them and the stars in the sky. My gaze was cut short when I heard footsteps approaching me. I looked in the direction of the twigs crunching below feet, but saw only the very slight figure of someone. I laughed and said to my sister, you may need to carry me back. The person continued walking to me and then sat down in front of me. I smiled and then looked back up into the trees, but then I immediately dropped my gaze back down to the person while I realized that whoever was sitting right in front of me was not my sister or her boyfriend. I tried to focus my sight, but could only see the outline of this person and the whites of their eyes. A feeling of sobriety hit me, and I knew that I could possibly be in real danger. I looked at them while they did the same to me. Their gaze never left me, and after about ten seconds, I stood up and began walking away. My drunk state returned, and walking efficiently was difficult. I kept turning around, expecting to see the stranger come at me, but I saw nothing. And after spinning in circles, trying to see anything, I saw a beam of light in the distance for a second and then disappear. It was the flashlight. It had to be. I started running towards where I had seen it. I can't be sure, but as I ran, I thought I heard someone running behind me. But it might have just been my imagination because of my adrenaline. I saw the light again and stopped when I reached my sister's boyfriend. He laughed and asked where I went, and then I saw my sister stumbling behind him. I told them both, slurring my words, that there was somebody else out here. He laughed, but my sister drunkenly agreed to go back up to the cabin. We all made it back inside and were exhausted from climbing up that incline. I spent the night sleeping on the couch and was paranoid that whoever I saw down in the woods would try to come inside, and I kept looking out all the windows that were visible to me, expecting to see the whites of their eyes again. I will start by saying that this story is true, and I will not exaggerate anything. My best friend Katie and I were exploring the abandoned industrial ship docks across town. Since we were born, they've been abandoned, and my parents have always just said that they weren't needed anymore, so they were just left to rot. There is a tall building standing next to the ship dock, and clear across town, 
you can see the broken windows at the top. It looks very creepy, and it was only a matter of time before Katie and I checked it out. There were signs everywhere saying, Do not trespass, and private property. That didn't stop us one night. We waited for the sun to set, and armed with flashlights, we walked the seven blocks over to the fishing docks. The plan was to run across the street as fast as possible and hop the fences guarding the property before anybody could drive by and see us. That plan succeeded and we both made it over fast. We sprinted down the old dock over to the building and to our surprise, the door wasn't locked in any way. It just opened right up for us. The first room we saw had nothing in it and we went up the staircase to the second floor. On this floor, there were papers scattered everywhere, and I picked up one to read it. It looked like an old manifest or something like that of the ships that would pass through many years ago. Katie waited for me, and we both ran up to the third floor. The door was unlocked just like the first two, and we went inside. There was nothing in there except for more papers. We continued up to the fourth floor, and when we turned the doorknob expecting it to open, it didn't. It was locked. We shook it hard, but it didn't budge. Suddenly, we thought we heard something inside the room. There was a gap under the door between it and the top step of the stairs, and we both got down to peek inside with our lights. When we did this, we were shocked to see a pair of shoes walk over to the door and hit the door with something hard. Katie and I flew down the stairs, and when we got to the second floor, the door we entered in was now closed, but not just closed, locked. Then, we heard a door open from upstairs, hyperventilating as we heard footsteps coming down the stairs. The door finally opened. We flew down the remainder of the stairs to the ground level, and when we were back outside, we ran over to the adjacent building and hid behind the corner. I peeked around it, and nobody came out that door. We waited there for a few minutes, and then left. We both have told this story, and we don't have any explanation or clue how that door locked us inside for the 20 seconds that it did. I've never looked at the docks or that building the same. It gives me the creeps to think that somebody is up there. So, this was when I was much younger, in college. I'm sure you could find this, as it was in the news, local RI news, if you tried hunting for it. I was dating a girl that went to a school in Providence, Rhode Island. It was the summer, and everyone was back home. My girlfriend's best friend had an internship back in Providence, and this girl had a four-bedroom multi-family home to herself. The other three roommates were paying for their rooms but chose to stay home. I guess they could only get this place if they started paying rent two to three months prior to the school year starting, but whatever. One weekend, my girlfriend asks me to go to Providence with her to spend some time with her friend. She is lonely and has nothing to do on the weekends. We're only like one hour from Providence, so it sounds like a plan. We head down and we just chill for the night, drink, and do some cocaine. It's about 2 a.m. and we decide to walk out and get some cigs. Nothing special. We walk by a guy on our way home from the gas station who is just staring at us. Kind of creepy, but no big deal, as it's 2 a.m. in Providence and her house wasn't located in the best of areas, but certainly not the worst. We eventually all pass out, and me and my girlfriend head home the next day. The end of the week comes and my girlfriend asks if I want to go to Providence again, but I can't as I have to work all weekend so I decline. She heads down there, and her friend's boyfriend is coming to stay over. Pretty much a repeat of the weekend before. They all drink, but end up going out and partying a little bit. 
They are walking back after a night of drinking when they enter the mudroom around 2 a.m. They close the mudroom door behind them, which was left unlocked, and there's a dude really raggedy looking in there waiting for them. He says out loud to them, Get in the fucking house. They all turn around and he has a gun. My girlfriend's friend has already unlocked the door to the house and it's partially opened. Everyone is frozen in place and the guy repeats himself, Get in the fucking house. The boyfriend then steps forward with his hands up a little bit as to not seem confrontational and says, Hey man, calm down. It's all good. I don't know how the fuck this dude was brave enough to do any of this. As he says that, the dude shoots him. My girlfriend and her friend run into the house and hide under a bed. They can't hear this, but the assailant took off and didn't follow them back in. They don't know this though and are terrified, hiding under a bed while the boyfriend is screaming for help. They think the psycho has come into the house and is looking for them. My girlfriend told me they were both silently crying under the bed while the boyfriend screamed for help and, this is the worst part, yelling out, Help me! I'm dying! The neighbors heard the gunshot and screaming and called the police. They ended up catching the dude. He had been watching the girl for weeks. It was the guy we had seen watching us the week prior. Worst part was, the girl's boyfriend ended up dying. When I was 21 years old, I met this girl on a dating website. She was beautiful and seemed to be very intelligent. We went to a restaurant on our first date and it went very well. We made out in my car afterwards and listened to music. She had a young son, three years old, and I grew close to the both of them over a few months of dating her. After about six months of dating, I broke up with her, but not randomly and not without a very good reason. She and her son lived with her dad, and her dad was a very mean guy. He didn't like us being together, and he would do crazy rude shit, like walk into the living room and bluntly ask when I was leaving, or sometimes tell her I wasn't allowed to come over to see them for no reason. I grew very tired of his shit, and honestly, I noticed her acting like him at times, being very rude to people like my brothers or anyone in my family. We were at a family function one time, and my cousin was talking about her new job and felt comfortable enough to blurt out how much money the company started her at. Well, my weird ex-girlfriend interrupted her with this, I make double what you make, and then proceeded to crack up laughing at her. We argued on the way home, and I knew this was not the one for me. So after I broke up with her due to her behavior at times, and her asshole father, she acted out and was taking it hard, I guess is one way to put it. She called my work and told my boss I did drugs, which I have never done a single drug in my life. I ended up getting tested and passed, of course, in which case my boss told me, you need to get rid of that woman. She would call me all the time, and I mean like 50 times a day, sometimes leaving voicemails of her crying, and sometimes leaving voicemails of her cussing me out, and telling me she hates me and is going to kill me. One day, on my lunch break, I walked out to my car and checked my voicemails like I always do. There was only one of her, and she was crying and screaming and cussing me out and threatening me. This is the kicker though. At one point, I heard her physically hurt her son to make him cry and then blamed him crying on the fact that I left them. At the beginning of the call, I could hear him asking her questions calmly. He was fine. I was shocked and called my mom to ask her if she thought I should call CPS or 911 or what she thought I should do. I ended up calling CPS and they asked me several questions about her and about our relationship which I told them had ended. They hung up with me and I expected a backlash straight from hell. 
but she didn't call me again. A few weeks go by, and I get nothing from her. No texts or calls. After work one day, I headed home, and when I walked inside my house, she was sitting in my living room, holding her son, who was asleep, rocking him back and forth, and has a huge kitchen knife in her hand. Not that it matters at all, but the knife wasn't even from my kitchen. She brought it to my house with her. She just looked at me and smiled, and after a gut-wrenching silence, which seriously almost made me hyperventilate, she says, I didn't want to kill you in front of him, but I couldn't get a sitter. I kind of laughed at her, and her psychotic comment was my cue to walk away. I turned around calmly and went out my front door. I called the cops when I got to my car, and they came and took her away. I got a restraining order after that, and she called a few more times before finally everything stopped. I feel bad for her son, and I hope she found the help she needed, and I really hope I never have to see her crazy face again. One dark night, a 15-year-old girl named Lydia was walking home from her friend's house. She turned down a narrow street to take a shortcut and was startled by the sight of an old man standing in her path. When she stopped, the old man turned to her and in a hoarse voice said, Tell me the way. His face was disgusting his skin covered in scars and boils, his hair stringy and unkempt, his eyes bulging horribly, almost popping out of their sockets. Lydia was terrified. She was alone in a dark and narrow alleyway with a strange and disturbing person. Her heart began pounding, and it took her a few seconds to catch her breath. Tell me the way, the old man demanded. Okay, okay, uh, where are you going? Asked Lydia, nervously. When the old man told her the address he was searching for, a chill ran down her spine. It was her house. Uh, I don't know where that is, she replied curtly as she pushed past the old man and ran down the alleyway. Glancing back, she could see him standing in the alley, watching her flee. Lydia was so freaked out by the incident that she didn't stop running until she got back to her house. Breathing a sigh of relief, she took out her keys. She looked up and down the street to make sure the old man hadn't followed her. It was empty. She turned the key unlocked the door and pushed it open. From the darkness inside her house, a hoarse voice said, Tell me the way. So I've lived in the British countryside my whole life. So dark woodland and animal noises are nothing new or noteworthy for me. I joined the scouts too. So many nights were spent playing tracking and stealth games in the woods. I knew the terrain and the area like the back of my hand. However, the campsite was much larger than I had actually known when I was younger. There were some beat down old signs labeling the borders of the camp to the neighboring moorland and a murky pond full of duckweed. This is also where a toilet block was located, a small wooden shack with showers and stuff inside. The light had been broken as long as I've ever known, so when camping up this end of the site, we used to tie gas lamps to the washing line to light it up at night. For some reason, when going here alone, I always felt strange. When it was loud and busy, I could ignore this feeling. It was most pronounced on one night when I was finished in the bathroom before my friend, but I was waiting for him. We were about nine or ten at this point, 
so of course we didn't want to go alone. But there I was, perched on a tree branch alone for a good 20 minutes. No clue what he was doing in there. The whole time, I didn't feel alone. I felt a strange presence in the trees behind me, which I brushed off as me being paranoid. Eventually, it got too much and I climbed a little higher up on my tree to get a better view of the woods. What I saw, what I could swear, were eyes. However, they weren't that of a cat, badger, or any other animal I recognized. They looked almost human. They stared back at me for a good few seconds while I held my breath, trying to melt back into the tree until a loud bang was heard startling me and so I looked back to see my friend was finished. I quickly looked back where the eyes had been to see nothing and so I hurried back with my friend to our camp and nothing else strange happened for the rest of that weekend. So there's a reason I mentioned earlier that the grounds were bigger than I had known then. I always felt a little uneasy in that one end of the woods like I was being watched and there was nothing past that toilet block on our crude printout maps. However, there was a much larger tapestry map in the base room, which I had never paid much attention to. Since the weird eyes incident, I tended to avoid using that block at all, sometimes even bothering to walk a whole mile to the fancy clean ones near base in the middle of the night. When I was 12, I remember making my way back from the nicer toilet block. I was daydreaming a little, as it would take me a while to get back to camp, and so wasn't fully paying attention to my surroundings. I suddenly heard a faint crunching of leaves right behind me, too heavy and uncoordinated to be any animal. I whipped around and punched it. So of course, I was very shaken up and while running entirely on adrenaline, I didn't get a decent look at the thing. I just punched and smacked it like only a terrified preteen girl could, while stumbling backwards to get away, when something pulled up beside me and the strange creature slinked away, gone in an instant. I think it had claws, as I had scratches all up my arms but didn't remember being near any brambles. I looked back to see my scout leader had pulled up in his quad bike. He'd been looking for me since the other girls had said how long I'd been, as I had the extra walk by avoiding the creepy bathroom. So I was safe. He gave me a lift back to camp, but I still have nightmares about what might have happened to me if he hadn't come when he did. Nothing else happened since that incident until I was 15. Our gas lamps were running out, so we only had one very dim light left, just enough to light up the sink's area. The nicer toilet block wasn't an option this time, as another group were camping near there and I would feel awkward as heck just waltzing into someone else's camp. As I went to open the door to the cubicle, I felt a slight vibration through the wood, and as the door swung open, I saw a pale, humanoid figure slide out of sight. I kind of just turned and walked out, not really sure how to react, and since the last time I'd come across a weird creepy thing, I still had scars to show for it. All I knew was I didn't want to be near it. Needless to say, I pissed in the woods that night. So one day, I decided to ask my friend if he had ever had any weird experiences around there. He said he did. He said he saw an alien leaning over the jetty of the pond. He assumed it was drinking, but that was it. He thought he had dreamed it, but his description of the thing matched mine exactly. When I was 16, so just a few months after the last incident, I was working at the campsite for a few weeks in the summer. I had been given the job of cleaning the border signs, which surprised me a little as they hadn't ever been cleaned 
as far as I could remember, but I did so anyway with a little help carrying the stepladder and bucket of water while walking further past the creepy toilet block to get to the border the landscape begins to get less wooded and more open so you can see further in the distance i noticed a weird shape that looked kind of like a castle this was confusing as to my knowledge this campsite didn't have any castle so of course when we got back to base i decided to take a closer look at the tapestry map which was pretty faded and dirty, obviously very old. Far to the west, I could see a little castle-shaped area with the label, The Ruins. I asked the climbing instructor what she knew about it, as she had been living there the longest and we were pretty close. She said the campsite used to have some old ruins, but they got more and more overgrown with brambles and unstable so they fenced them off. A year after the ruins had been fenced off, a child went missing, and the body was found in the thick bramble bushes. They assumed he had gone to play alone and fallen, so they cut the area off maps so kids wouldn't be tempted to go exploring there. This was during the summer, so the evenings were bright and warm. I decided to go and take a look at the ruins. Excited, by the prospect of discovering a new area of the site, and also morbidly curious about the events that all seemed to happen within a mile or two of there. As I was crossing the border of the campsite, I felt like I had stepped into another world. The sun shone through the trees, leaving shafts of light to wash over the bright green paradise. This area was completely untouched and beautiful. A few worn, handstone blocks littered around as the woods cleared out into the open moorland. I could see the ruins now. As I got closer, it changed. The grass was yellower, trees were losing their leaves, and the small, overgrown path was wet and muddy. I slipped a few times, muddying up my camera. The fence was rusted and corroded, falling apart in some places. I tried to wipe off my lens and get a few photos. Abandoned buildings always fascinated me. When I heard an all too familiar crunching sound, followed by a strange cry, it sounded almost in pain. Feeling brave and stupid and angry and you get the point. I pulled a piece of broken chain link fence out of the way, sliding underneath as silently as I could and tiptoeing towards where I heard the sound, trying desperately to control my breathing so as not to make my presence known to the thing. I eventually stumbled over a tree root, scraping my knee on the crumbling sandstone and let out a shriek of pain. Suddenly, the crying sound stopped. It knew I was there. I pulled myself to my feet and took a pained step backwards. On full alert looking for it, but I could no longer hear anything or see any sign of the thing. I felt somewhat relieved then and no longer interested in exploring. I limped my way back to the fence and sat down to patch my knee up and called my mom for a lift home. As I was about to start my way back to base where the road was, I heard a hiss sound and turned to see the thing leaning out of a tree, its body awkwardly distorted. Its claws were obvious in the light of day, so were its albino red dots for eyes. It had a long, forked tongue that stretched out of its mouth to lick the stone where I had scraped my knee, a small amount of blood still there. I recoiled in disgust and stared for a second at the clearest sight of the thing I had ever gotten. The first time I had seen the thing that had terrified me all these years, clearly in the light of day. It made eye contact, also staring for a second before the rest of its limp body 
flopped out of the tree, and it began to drag itself towards the fence at a ridiculous speed. I turned and ran, and didn't stop till I reached base. I've never been back to those ruins. I've never been to the creepy toilet block since. Nor have I been comfortable around that area of the camp in the dark. However, last weekend, I was a leader for a camp and was accompanying a girl to the bathroom. I sat down to wait outside when 30 seconds later, she came out screaming, saying she had seen a dead thing in the cubicle. I didn't go inside to check. I just grabbed her hand and took her straight back to camp. After which, I filed an official complaint about that toilet block. The wooden shack was worn and damaged. The locks and hinges were all rusty, and the light still hadn't been fixed, so the complaint was listened to, even if they didn't believe the creepy thing stories. The next morning, the whole block was boarded up, surrounded with yellow tape. Apparently, it got flooded, but I don't believe that's really the reason they finally closed it. I hope the thing really is dead. Now we can camp in peace. I hope. My sister Sarah walks at night. She often goes outside and walks around the farm. Two nights ago, I looked outside and saw her walking at a brisk pace, holding father's hatchet. It wasn't the first time she has butchered our cattle. We might have sent her away if not for the truth. She is asleep when she goes walking at night. Father has been gone for five years, and mother cries most of the time. She cries because of Sarah. It was 1.30 after midnight when I awoke. I know she opened my door as I shut it when I sleep. She often walks around with knives and sharp farm tools. When I walked down the stairs, I saw her. She was sitting in father's chair, clutching a knife. She was looking at me. I took a single step towards her, and she sprung up to her feet and took two paces towards me and then stopped. I said her name, Sarah, and told her I would take her back to bed. She said to me, I am not sleeping. I then asked her if she was not asleep, then why is she holding a knife? She spoke, because I want to kill you and mother. I told her she was ill and needed to put the knife back before mother catches her. She turned around and walked outside. I didn't leave the house that night. When mother and I found Sarah in the morning, she had stabbed herself in the eye and was dead, face down outside the barn. I'm worried about mother. She hasn't walked at night since stabbing father five years ago. She says she was asleep when she did it. My mother never sleeps. Again? Again? Those were the words I heard daddy saying while looking down at one of the chickens. It was completely ripped open. Blood was everywhere. This had been the fourth chicken this week. I was just a boy at the time, but I remember daddy shouting out that he would gut the beast that was eating our chickens. Daddy unraveled some wire and emptied out some cans of beans. He wired the cans around the perimeter of the coop. The beast would come, and when it hit the wire, the cans would sound. True to his plan, late that night, we heard the sound of the cans falling and clanking. 
The beast was outside. Daddy took the rifle, threw on his boots, and ran out there to face whatever beast was slaughtering those chickens. I watched from the window as I saw Daddy run out through the field and then stop dead. I ran outside to see what it was. When I approached, I looked at him. His mouth was open, with one lip curled in to create a face of disgust. It was no beast. It was a man. A skin and bones man with long hair and a beard. Not wearing clothes. He was hunched over a chicken. He was holding the mutilated bird above his head and letting the blood drain into his mouth. I had never seen something so terrifying. Not even 30 years later as I write this. Daddy lifted the rifle and yelled, You need to leave. I don't know if it was on purpose, but Daddy shot the gun and almost hit the man. The man quickly got up and looked at my daddy. A bloody smile he gave and then ran away. He never came back, but I wonder, why was he eating the chickens? Maybe some sort of satanic ritual. Maybe he was ill. Or maybe he just liked the taste of blood. The lady that my mother asked to watch my sisters and I was not well. She would arrive at our flat at dark while my mother was gone and watch us until she returned. She would always insist on playing hide and go seek. My sisters and I love this game, but not with the lights off. She would insist that all the lights are off. This night, it was first my turn to find them. I found my sisters first. They were downstairs hiding together under the table. The lady was hiding somewhere upstairs. I was too afraid to go look after the last visit. She came out of the darkness and grabbed me. When I screamed, she put her fingers down my throat. Me and my sisters waited in the library until mother returned. She was very upset with the lady. She could not find her either. Mother decided that she had gone, but I was afraid she was still here. As I lay in bed, I began to fall asleep. But then I opened my eyes and she was there, standing at the edge of my bed. As I screamed, she put her fingers down my throat and my eyes poured tears. This story is 100% real. It is about an experience I had going on the deep web. For those of you who don't know, the deep web is pretty much the hidden internet. It isn't indexed by search engines, and you need special software to go on it. It is several thousand times bigger than the surface internet, which can be reached by Google or Yahoo, etc. It is also home to many illegal things. You can buy stolen guns, any drug you can imagine, stolen phones, you can even hire hitmen. Any illegal thing you can imagine is on the deep web. I never had a great childhood. My dad was gone all the time, and my mom was too. When she was home, it was normally verbal and physical abuse. I always needed to have a way to escape it all, whether it was playing video games, watching movies, or even drinking. One day, I was invited over to a friend's house for a sleepover. When I got there, he immediately told me he had something to show me. We went upstairs and he showed me his laptop. He said he had got onto the deep web. We stayed up late that night, browsing through all the interesting things on it. He showed me how to use it, and I took some notes. 
The next day, I decided to try it out for myself. I downloaded the software, and I was good to go. When on the deep web, there is a page full of links. In order to go to sites, you keep clicking on the new links that pop up. At first, it was very boring. Tons of dead websites, or disgusting ones, filled with videos of real people being killed. Eventually, I found a forum. I can't remember what it was about, but I asked how to get to any interesting sites that were not illegal. One guy sent me a link and said it was a site that contained leaked government documents. I thought that was interesting, so I clicked on it. When I pulled up the page, I was pretty shocked. It was a bunch of videos of people being tortured, raped, murdered in the most horrible of ways. I have a pretty strong stomach, so I was ready to ignore it and just exit, but I realized that all the videos were playing at once. When I moved the mouse over one, there was no bar that let you pause or stop it. That's when it hit me. These were all thousands of live streams. I clicked on one that said, Homeless man kidnapped in my basement. In it, a man was tied to a chair covered in blood. To his left was a table, and on it was a whole bunch of tools like axes, knives, drills, hammers, etc. And... There was a hooded man standing by it. On the right of the live stream, there was a chat box, and people were requesting the hooded man to do various things, like cut off the homeless man's hand, rip out his hair, and nasty things like that. Eventually, one man in the chat box said that he would pay several bitcoin for the hooded man to gouge out the homeless man's eyes. The hooded man agreed and grabbed what looked like a fork off the table and began to walk over to the homeless man. I quickly closed the live stream, but I could still hear it. I tried to leave the site, but it was frozen and I could only hear the horrible sounds coming from the stream. A few seconds later, the sounds stopped and a chat box appeared in the center of my screen. I couldn't exit it out. But then, in the box, somebody typed in, Hello, how did you like the site? I paused for a moment, not sure if it was some kind of automated message. But then, he typed again, Are you going to answer? I stayed frozen in place, but eventually typed in, Who is this? The guy explained that he was the owner of this site and that he liked to greet first-time users whenever he could. I got a disgusted look on my face, and this is where things got really scary. In the chat box, the man typed, It's rude to make faces, Jake. My eyes got wide, and I noticed my webcam was on when I always keep it off. Also, how did this man know my name? I covered up the webcam with a sticky note and typed, How do you know my name? I'm calling the police. There was a brief pause, and then horrifyingly, a whole bunch of data was posted in the box. I looked at it and realized what it was. It was everything about me. My full name, email, address, my age... It even had all my parents' info as well. I panicked and shut off my computer, and I hoped that it would be the end of that. I did a complete wipe of all my computer's data and went to get a drink. I was under a lot of stress. That night, my mom said she wouldn't be home. She didn't say where she was, but at this point in my life, I didn't care. My dad, of course was nowhere to be seen. I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up watching a movie. I ended up falling asleep 
on the couch. I don't know why, but at about 2.30 in the morning, I woke up. The TV was still on, and it gave off a dim light. But when I opened my eyes a little more, I almost screamed. There was a man standing just a few feet away from me with a mask on. I flew off the couch and darted for the door. I heard heavy footsteps coming after me. I flung open the door and ran outside screaming as loud as I could, trying to get someone's attention. I looked behind me and saw the man. He was running, and he was faster than me. I screamed louder and noticed I had tears running down my face. Then, a bag wrapped around my head and I was pushed to the ground with such force that I felt blood in my mouth. I heard a car speed up beside me and I was being dragged to the sound of it. They were taking me away and probably I was going to be on that website. I had almost accepted my fate when the man with the mask screamed in pain and dropped me. I pulled the bag off my head and saw a van speed away and then I saw my neighbor hitting the masked man with a baseball bat. The police arrived, took the masked man in, eventually caught the van and shut down the site. My mom and I moved out, and I will never, ever go on the deep web again. And I encourage others to never go on it either. This was told to me by an ex-boyfriend of mine about five years ago. I don't remember his exact words, but I do remember the gist of the tale. He lied to me many times, but I wasn't dating him for his intelligence. It seemed he believed this is what happened to him. As far as what actually happened, I don't know, and I'm not going to ask him. I just wanted to know if this is something he made up or if someone else has experienced these creatures as well. From the smell and size, I immediately thought skunk ape, but after reading about the skunk ape, I decided against it. This happened circa 1995, probably spring, and I believe it was near a suburb southeast of Orlando. He said he lived at the last house in a cul-de-sac in a predominantly Cuban neighborhood. My ex, hereafter referred to as X, said this takes place in the woods near either an abandoned airport or mall. I think airport, but I can't remember precisely. He and two of his friends went into the woods there one night when they were in their early teens. I dare say they had beer and were looking for a private place to drink and shenanigans. They go deeper into the woods. X smells something first. Then his friends comment on it. It smells like garbage, he says. Absolutely reeks of garbage. A blob of black sludge drops on the front of X's shirt. It stinks. It is the vile aroma they had been detecting for several minutes now. In front of him drops a very tall, around eight foot, thin creature with red eyes. It is covered in long, fine black hair. The way it lands, he said, was the most horrifying part. It landed without a sound. It landed on its feet from branches that had to be at least ten feet in the air. It landed without disturbing the ground, like an illusion. They ran home. But that's not the end. Being an idiot, X decided to borrow his father's pistol, which of course was not secured in any meaningful way and returned to the woods to kill these things before they had decided to come out of the woods and cause some kind of chaos. He did not know if they were aliens or demons, but he found both conditions offensive. He returned to the woods alone after dark. It wasn't long before he smelled the creature's stink or before the same thing dropped down in front of him again five yards away. He raised the pistol and aimed to fire. The creature only stared at him. This is where I start to lose my suspension of disbelief. X suddenly feels that this thing is no threat. He lowers the pistol and the creature takes off into the woods and X gives chase. A quarter mile or so later, he chases the creature into a clearing where there are more of these things. 
There is a larger one in the center, standing with the one X was chasing. They appear to be in conversation. This larger one is more of a gray color and taller. They both look at X, and the gray one raises his long-fingered, bony hand towards the young boy. The small, black-haired one seems to say something to the gray one. X says the communication was not audible. The message is clear. It's all right. He won't hurt us. The gray-haired creature lowers his arm. At this point, outnumbered, X flees. He never went back into those woods, alone or otherwise. And that's the tale. I'm not sure if I believe it myself, but he swore it was true. I've told it to the best of my knowledge and memory, as well as refining his telling into something more readable. Has anyone else seen these things? This story is from the perspective of a female. In high school, I had to write a paper which summarized my life story, starting from birth. I reflected on my earliest memories, and when I remembered this, I had to sit down. My heart pounded as I realized what had actually happened, and what my four-year-old self couldn't understand. When I was a kid, my family often vacationed with their friends' families, and we'd all live together in a giant beach house or a cabin for a week. This must have been one of the first of those vacations. I wanted to hang out with the rest of the kids, but since they were all at least one year older than me, they thought I was uncool. I followed my sister around the house, but since she didn't want to play with me, I mostly just eavesdropped on everybody's conversations. One day... All the kids happened to be in one room, no adults, plenty of toys. It was hell of fun. Off to the side was this tiny door, the tiniest I had ever seen, which led to a dark, empty room. I remember we were absolutely fascinated by that tiny door, and the older kids would make up stories about it. Jennifer was one of the eldest, and in my memories, she's a teenager. But that might be skewed since I thought everyone in the double digits was super mature. She even knew how to use her mom's cell phone. All the kids were playing, having fun, enjoying their childhood. Then Jennifer got a call. She had to ask us to be quiet several times, and she sounded really serious. I thought this request was silly and a little annoying since I really wanted to play. The call ended. Jennifer told us, My dad is coming back here soon. Jennifer's dad had driven away for a few hours, but now was driving back. Someone asked questions about where he went and what he was doing. I think she said something about drinking. At some point, Jennifer addressed all of us and said something like, My dad looks at kids and takes them on drives. You all have to be really careful when he comes back. I couldn't grasp anything else she said. Then she talked to a girl and a boy. I noticed he was looking at you two a lot, so you both have to be really, really careful. I think he wants to take you each on a drive, but don't go with him if he asks. Their conversation went on for a while, and I felt jealous that they talked so much with Jennifer and that her dad was looking at them instead of me. Why wasn't I special? I grew bored of listening to them and went back to playing. A car pulled up, and Jennifer told us to go into the tiny door room. We brought some toys along. I was psyched to go through the tiny door, but it ended up being a dark, empty room without any fairies or hobbits. After a while, we left. As far as I know, Nothing bad happened on that trip. I grew up with the two kids Jennifer talked to, and they seemed pretty well adjusted, but Jennifer and her family never vacationed with us again. I told my family this story, and they thought it was an imaginary memory that my four-year-old brain had concocted. My parents are positive there weren't any weird, creepy, or alcoholic dads there, just their good friends. My sister didn't remember any of it. I can't rationalize how or why I would have imagined it. My childhood was great, 
and I had zero concept of pedophiles and alcoholism until I was like 11. Luckily, this experience did not ruin tiny doors for me in the slightest. I love me some tiny doors. When I was a kid, my dad would always take me to this one specific beach to go fishing. I loved it so much that even when I grew up, I continued to go there, sometimes with my friends and sometimes alone. This story happened when I was alone. I backed my truck up to the water, released my boat, parked my truck up at the top of the ramp, and I headed out. It was a beautiful day, but a bit overcast. I enjoyed the occasional nap while out on the water, and today, I needed one. I kicked my feet up, and I put my head back. I must have fell into a pretty deep sleep, because when I woke up, my boat was still floating peacefully. But to my horror, there was another boat right next to mine. I stood up in surprise and saw that there was another fisherman sitting on his boat in a chair, looking at me. He was older than me, maybe in his fifties. He had long brown hair that was slicked back, and honestly, he looked like bad news. He gave me a weird smile and said, Rise and shine. I nervously chuckled and told him I didn't mean to doze off and I had to be on my way. My heart started to pound when the guy said, Nope. But he didn't move from his chair. I got up and started the motor on my boat and drove away. I have no idea why he said nope to me when I told him I had to leave. I have no idea why he just sat there and let me leave. But damn, that was so nerve-wracking. When I was 14, my grandfather wasn't able to take me home from the train station, so I had a five-kilometer walk ahead of me. It was autumn and already getting dark and chilly, so I wrapped my jacket closer around my body. I put on my over-the-ear headphones and started walking. After just a few minutes, I noticed that the guy I already saw in the train was following me. I thought not much of it, as I was still walking in the city, and there could have been a thousand reasons that guy, which was in his mid-thirties to his early forties, short brown hair, totally modest in appearance, was walking in the same direction. I continued walking, and after some time, I was leaving the city in the direction of my little village about one kilometer from the borders of the city. As I walked past the little skate park, I began getting scared because actually at this point, it was odd that he still walked behind me. Not many people live in that direction. I walked a little faster now and pressed pause on my phone so I could hear better where the guy was. When there were about 600 meters left to my home, I started running and the man ran after me. My panic grew, and as I arrived at our front yard, I hurried to get the lock of the door open. We had a huge yard, and our house was on top of a little hill. The metal door was at the bottom of it. I slammed the door shut behind me and ran the rest of the way up to my home's front door. I was so relieved when I was inside that I began to cry, and my grandma asked what happened. So I told her, but she just waved it off. I grew up with my grandparents, but it wasn't the best and happiest time ever, and my grandma would believe a stranger on the street more than she would believe me. I looked out the kitchen window, and there he still was, standing outside the door to our yard, staring directly at me. After about 20 to 30 minutes later, he turned around and walked away. I don't know if that person wanted to prank me or if I actually escaped something worse. But luckily, I never saw that man again, even though I still panicked from time to time when someone walked close to me. For our honeymoon, we decided to rent an old cottage out in the countryside, wanting to have a quiet, relaxing week of just the two of us. Being isolated in the woods sounded perfect. And for the first few days, 
It was. But that all changed on the fourth night when my wife was looking for batteries for the TV remote. Digging in the drawers in the kitchen, she found a pack and a DVD with the name Jessica written in marker. Our nosiness got the better of us, and we thought it would be entertaining to see someone else's home movie. The video was choppy with one scene ending abruptly and the next quickly following, the first of which was a woman smiling at the camera and the person holding it. It looked like they were at a barbecue party as everyone was outdoors in summery clothes and listening to music. The scene ended with the girl asking the cameraman to dance with her. The next clip appeared to have been from a different day. The couple was now in a car and the camera was placed on the dash so that both were in view this time. They were giggling and singing along to the songs on the radio. It was clear that these two were on some sort of romantic getaway. If only we had stopped at this point, we could have left it on such a happy moment. But we didn't, and the surprise event change of the next scene made our stomachs sink. The clip was shaky, but it was clear that whoever was holding the camera was now chasing the girl. They were running through thick brush, and the only sounds heard were the quick snapping of twigs and a person's shaky breath. The scene lasted about 45 seconds, with the camera mainly pointed down towards the chaser's shoes. We couldn't peel our eyes off the television screen. The next clip showed the chasing was done and the person holding the camera had gained control over their breathing. It was short, only lasting about 10 seconds, but it showed an old building that looked long abandoned. The final scene started immediately after, and it was the longest of all the videos, lasting about five minutes. Pointed once again towards a single pair of feet, it showed them walking in the woods at an even pace, but it looked like some time had passed as the ground was now illuminated in sunlight. When the video finally ended, we were creeped the fuck out. We didn't really know what to think or what to say to one another at first. When we were sure the doors were locked, we sat down and tried to think of possible ideas to explain what we just watched. We agreed that while it was unsettling, nothing actually happened on the tapes to make us feel the need to alert the cops in the middle of the night. It didn't show anyone being harmed. Before bed, we convinced ourselves that maybe it was just a horror short of some sort or an idea of a disturbing prank that helped us sleep that night. A couple days later, we pushed the video to the back of our minds so that we could continue enjoying the rest of our honeymoon. We decided to go on a nature hike since we were to be returning to the city soon. Not 15 minutes into our hike, we recognized pretty quickly we were on the same path as the one in the video. It was a surreal moment standing in the same spot the girl ran through. After a short debate, we decided we would continue just to see if we could find some evidence of it being real. We didn't feel a sense of danger. After all, it was the middle of fall and the footage looked like it was from spring, so they would likely be long gone. A few more minutes down the path, we spotted the dilapidated building just off to the side. Walking towards the door, we took a pause to ready ourselves. Swinging open the door, we found evidence of a horrific event inside. The air reeked with the smell of death. There was a blood stain caked in the dirt, and there were deep scratch marks carved into the backside of the door. Once we saw that, we ran full speed back to our car and drove straight to the police station. We told them about the DVD and what we found at the old building. They have no idea who the people on the found tape are, making them believe they were possible vacationers, but the landlord had no record of the couple or how the DVD even got there. Right now, 
The police think maybe the perpetrator squatted in the house between renters and left behind the DVD before we got there. They are still searching for any further clues. As for us, we're going to stick to hotels from now on. Hello again. Do you want more? Click the link on screen now to join me in the thunderstorm. Who knows, maybe someone else will stop by. Someone you know. Someone that will make sure that the darkness has taken control.